Good afternoon, everyone. And just, just to say that I'm from NICE, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And I'm not really going to talk about Wales, I have to confess. I'm, <laughs> NICE is an England-only body. We do do work with Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland, and we have different agreements with those three countries. But uh, just for the purpose of precision, what I'm saying applies to England primarily. And these are the things I'm going to talk about. I've been asked to cover how NICE fits within the health system, how we go about appraising new drugs. I can't, I can't let the moment escape without saying anything about the Cancer Drugs Fund that those of you from the UK will, will understand why. And we've agreed, the, the three of us speaking, that we'll say something about our appraisals of bevacizumab or avastin for colorectal cancer. And finally, some brief conclusions. So this, this is one of the simpler diagrams of the English health system. <laughs> and I'm not going to explain all the components of it. It's people and the communities at the center, government at the very outside of the circle. And in case you can't spot it, that circle there is nice in a layer that's labeled national organizations. Inside the ring are local organizations. And we are often described in the system as a regulator. In fact, we, we work closely with regulators, but our prime job is providing standards that the regulators then use and apply. It's very much a national health service, and we in, in England and the UK are all proud of our national health service, so much so it made it into the Olympics that some of you will remember. So that's, that's fundamental. I really want to emphasize that point because it's national. We don't like the postcode lottery of care. Briefly, NICE's purpose, 2016, because this is in our strategic plan, and it emphasizes that we are very much about supporting quality, sustainability, and productivity across both health and social care. And we do this by developing guidance and standards. Core to NICE is looking at value for money, and that's always been the difficult bit, the controversial bit. And when we do that, we have to think very carefully about what that new guidance that we decide is value for money is going to displace. And as best we can, we look at opportunities for disinvesting from ineffective practice. And I'm not going to focus on that. There was a good session before lunch on the challenges of doing that, but just to say it's always in our minds. The NICE was launched in 1999 by a Labour government very much about ending the postcode lottery that people don't like, but also about driving the uptake of effective and cost-effective new technologies. Then, as now, it was recognized that there's a challenge to get those new things into the system. So although NICE is sometimes seen as a rationing body, it also has this really important role of getting new things into the system. And just as the public value the National Health Service. They also want to have access to effective new drugs, especially cancer drugs, I, I think. And the government also values that too. We have a lot of vested interest in the life sciences industry. And so we really do want to support new effective things. And when we say no, it's always courted with controversy, negative headlines. And, of course, the public see and absorb all those messages. In a nutshell, this is an overview of the NICE process. Core to our decision-making are independent committees with a mixture of individuals. Absolutely, absolutely clear whenever we set up a committee that they have to be free of conflicts of interest. And over the years since NICE has been working, the criteria for being conflict of interest free, if you like, have become tighter and tighter to the extent now that people who chair those committees can not have any shares in any life sciences industry. They, um, 
they have to be independent in terms of their academic writing too. So we don't want people who've got spent their whole life researching something taking the core decisions at the end of the day. So that word independent is, is independent of the nice senior management, it's independent of government, but it's also independent thinkers. We provide those committees with reviews of the evidence, with cost-effective analysis, with input from topic experts who come and give their view, but they don't take part in the final decision-making, and perspectives from stakeholders. The public consultation is vital. It takes time. Sometimes NICE is accused of being slow. But the evidence, as I'm sure all of you in the room will know, is never black and white. You can't usually come to a straightforward conclusion. So a wider public consultation that does impact on the final decision is absolutely crucial. Um, and we do have um, support for those committees, a set of social value judgments that drive some consistency in the way that they are looking at the challenges they're faced with. I'm not going to talk a lot about health economics. You'll be pleased to know, I, I imagine. The quality, the quality adjusted life year is the metric that we use to provide standardization. We don't have an absolute threshold in terms of cost per quality, above which things get rejected and below which they don't. It's much more a graduated approach as outlined on this slide. So in the lower end, the green box things will usually be approved. In the red box, they usually won't, but with an emphasis on the usually, because the committee does have the ability to flex those decisions. We were never given that curve when we started. We, um, we developed the thinking through the independent committees and recognised how the decisions were being placed. And um, as the resources become tighter in our NHS, people do question whether this graph should change. Um, and we are always considering, discussing, debating whether it should. It has, interestingly, never been adjusted in terms of inflation. So the point being, there is some flexibility in how the decisions are taken. And this slide, hopefully you can see it at the back, this slide is an analysis from a few years ago now, but it's an analysis of some of the reasons why there was variation in uh, the appraisals that were sitting above the 30,000 per quali marker and why things were approved and why they weren't. And this is quite an important slide because when I come at the end to talk a bit about the decision making around bevacizumab, you'll see how some of these things were important in that decision making. So you've got things like severity of disease, end of life. We have some end of life criteria that I'll describe in a moment. Stakeholder comments, innovation. Was it a significantly new drug that the committee felt warranted funding? Was it a disadvantaged population or was it for children? So those factors were identified back in 2010. Since then, we are now much more explicit in how we reflect the factors that are taken into account during the decision making. It's one of the things that stakeholders have asked for over the years to see how these things are, con are considered. We don't rank them, we don't score them. Perhaps we should We'd welcome a discussion around that. So remember, remember the factors. End of life criteria. In 2009, we introduced these criteria and it was to provide permission, if you like, for committees when we were looking at drugs for 
patients who had a very limited life expectancy, fewer than 24 months. And in this group, if the drug was considered to extend life by more than three months and the affected patient population was small, then there was permission to increase the cost effectiveness threshold up to 50,000 pounds. So that's 50, yeah, 50,000 pounds. So that's what we introduced back in 2009. And we have appraised an awful lot of cancer drugs. So these criteria have been used a lot. And in the recent changes that have taken place in the light of the Cancer Drugs Fund that I'll come on to shortly, these end-of-life criteria have been modified and the bit that was felt to be unhelpful was the affected population being small. So that bit does no longer apply, but when we introduced it back in 2009, that is what it was. So, as I said, cancer drugs have formed the majority of the drugs that we have been considering, lots and lots of new treatments for cancer. And this analysis shows the threshold of cancer, of cost per quality for cancer drugs from 2007 to 2014. Um, and you can see the variation against the thresholds that are applied. And I guess you can't read the key because I can only just read it from here. <laughs> so I'll tell you what it says. The red blobs are recommended or partially recommended. Um, and the, the amber ones at the top are not recommended. And the blue ones, perhaps the blue ones are the important things to focus on, recommended under end of life criteria. So they are providing that bit of a bridge for things in the middle there that otherwise would not have been approved. It's, a, it's an interesting slide, isn't it? It shows quite a huge range of um, cost per quality that are coming through, and it does also illustrate the flexibility in the decision making. <clears throat> Again, focusing on anti-cancer agents and some of the variation. This is a running total that we keep at NICE in terms of our decisions around cancer appraisals. Because if you read just the Daily Mail, you'd probably think we said no to everything. For those who don't know, STA stands for short technology appraisal, single technology appraisal, and multiple technology appraisal, where we look at more than one drug at one time. Um, I think if you focus on that column, you will see that 30, just over 30% of cancer appraisals in that time frame, we said no to, so just under a third. The others were in some way either an absolute yes or they were contextualized in some way. <clears throat> so that hopefully gives you a flavor of the types of decision that we're making and the numbers that are getting through into the system. In the session before lunch, we were reflecting on how you prioritize in healthcare, and usually the focus is on things that, that are available for treatment. But of course, what NICE has as a core role is that job to manage things into the system. And so there's quite a lot that we do to actually stop expenditure in the first place, because by saying there's a third of these drugs here, that we don't think are value for money. That prevents expenditure. That tends to not get reflected in the work that we do. Patient access schemes. Patient access schemes were a new thing that were introduced um, at the end of the 2000s to manage the costs of new drugs. Because if you think about, if you think about what I said at the beginning, we value a national health service, we don't want postcode prescribing, <clears throat> we do want to access effective new drugs, but we've got a limited budget. So one thing you can do is to look at the price. Can we get the price down? 
and the patient access schemes were a new introduction to allow companies to provide us with a scheme where the NHS would in effect pay less for that drug. We don't directly, we don't directly look at those um, applications. They come to us via the Department of Health, but once they've been referred to us, we have a special unit, the patient access scheme liaison unit to consider the proposals and then they go back to the committee to see whether in the light of that proposal are they, um, are they going to let us recommend the drug as value for money. And they have varied over the years from simple discount schemes to um, free provision of, of medicines to a range of other things, sometimes quite complicated and the complexity wasn't helpful. Nowadays, they are much more standardized. So that was, that was in place in 2009. In 2010, important bit of context that we need to just cover is the Cancer Drugs Fund. We had a new government in 2010 and they were very concerned about the importance of cancer to the public and the fact that we were not approving all the new cancer drugs. There was a report published that said that new cancer drugs in the UK <coughs> were being used much less than in other similar countries. So the government set up the Cancer Drugs Fund, which would allow access to cancer drugs that otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. And the aim of the Cancer Drugs Fund was to provide provision to things that we hadn't looked at, that we were currently looking at, or things that we hadn't recommended. So as you can imagine, with that in place, the incentive for companies to think about patient access schemes and pricing back to my previous slide, was not there. Interestingly, when the Cancer Drugs Fund was first introduced, it was being managed through regional bodies that we had called strategic health authorities. Some of you from the UK will remember the strategic health authorities. And when they were in place as regional bodies, the Cancer Drugs Fund was actually not used a great deal. But once it became a national fund managed through a single body, NHS England, the expenditure on cancer drugs increased. But to be fair to it, it was intended to be a short-term fund until March 2014, and that there was going to be a longer-term longer -term pricing mechanism, and I'm not going to sidetrack us into that, but the government, as they introduced this, wanted to introduce something new called value-based pricing. Um, some of you will remember that. Some of you may indeed have worked on that because a, a, a number of academic bodies did, did a lot of work around value-based pricing. But at the end of the day, we don't have that new scheme. So the costs to the Cancer Drugs Fund increased. So you can see on the top row of that slide the amount being spent on the Cancer Drugs Fund year on year on year. And of course, going quite a lot over budget by the time you get to 14, 15. 416 million on the Cancer Drugs Fund. So bearing in mind this was now in the context of pressures on the NHS, it was rather a challenge. And of course, in the context of this Cancer Drugs Fund, because it was only a temporary measure, it hadn't really been thought through in terms of how long would something stay on the Cancer Drugs Fund. There was no mechanism for things to be dropped off. So over the last 12 months, this has all been considered, largely by NICE and the Department of Health and NHS England together, to develop a new Cancer Drugs Fund. This, it wasn't abolished entirely because of the, the awareness that cancer is an important condition to the public, but it has become much more 
um, managed, if you like, managed, that's a good word, and much more directed by NICE. And things now go into the Cancer Drugs Fund, where we think there isn't enough evidence to say a drug can be routinely prescribed. And we think it's got potential for satisfying the criteria for routine use in the future, including that end-of-life EOL, end-of-life criteria. So there's a category of cancer drugs where we will say, no, we're convinced this isn't value for money. There are others where we say, yes, this is fine, routinely commission this drug. But it's the group in the middle where there's not enough evidence, but actually we think it might be useful in the future. And the final bit for a drug to go into the Cancer Drugs Fund requires the company to say they will fund data collection, usually no more than 24 months. And there is also um, an agreement which makes the drug affordable within the budget. So NICE is doing the decision making. NHS England still manages the budget and it's still in early days. At the moment, NICE is now reappraising the drugs that were on the Cancer Drugs Fund. If you remember the drugs that, um, that we had said no to before, some of those might now have more data. Some of them have indeed now gone into routine commissioning. But there's a whole series of things now off the Cancer Drugs Fund that we are looking at. So I wanted to give you all that context, all that special cancer stuff, before I move on to the example that I was going to give in relation to the appraisal of bevacizumab metastatic colorectal cancer. Now, in, in my job at NICE, I don't get into the, into the gubbins of <laughs> the technology appraisal process on a day-to-day -day basis. I am involved on a weekly basis in the sign-off of all the technology appraisals to check they've all been through the correct process. But because I was coming to talk about this, I had to read through the appraisals. And I must say, they were not the most straightforward, highly complex. I liaised with the technical team, and I've distilled it all down into a few slides, which undoubtedly doesn't do the complexity justice, but hopefully it gives enough probably more than enough than you ever wanted to know about the appraisal of Bevacizumab. You'll see at the bottom here, the marketing authorization permits use at any line of treatment. So that didn't really help my uh, study of the background material for this. So in terms of what we found when we looked at Bevacizumab first line and the clinical effectiveness, the evidence and indeed a concurrence between the clinicians and the patients showed that when it was combined with oxaliplatin, there was a modest clinical benefit. But overall survival from it, one clinical trial showed only 1.4 months and people weren't convinced by the robustness of that evidence. So the end of life criteria, which were three months, that wasn't met and there wasn't a small patient population because at that point we were using the patient population size criterion. In terms of cost effectiveness, um, cost per quality 105 to 108 hundred thousand. I've got the right and the thousand, sorry, I've got my numbers wrong. 105 to 108 thousand pounds per quality. There was a patient access scheme, so it came down a bit but still quite high. And the committee were clear that there was a lot of uncertainty around those estimates. And they also discussed whether it was a, an innovative technology. They recognized it was a novel mode of action, but they decided it wasn't substantially innovative. So they went through all those steps, which I've talked about in theory when they were looking at Bevacizumab first line. And now just jumping on a little bit, if you now look at the NICE website, you'll see a pathway for managing colorectal cancer. There's a whole section on first line agents. And Bevacizumab in combination with oxaliplatin, da 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 is not recommended. 
which you might have concluded from the slides I've just shown you, that with all that uncertainty and the cost, they didn't recommend it. So that was originally a decision back in 2010. It was revisited in 2013. Static list means that there was nothing new that anyone thought was going to change the decision or indeed in the immediate period afterwards. So it's on our static list. <coughs> which means it doesn't routinely get reviewed, but it can come out of hibernation if something exceptional appears. So second line, clinical and cost effectiveness. Again, limited evidence to show how much bevacizumab would extend life as a second line agent. Um, and the first time we looked at this, the manufacturer said that they couldn't make a cost effectiveness case. When we looked at it specifically for second line use, we came up with an ISA which was 90 to 88,000 pounds per quali. And again, end of life criteria were not met. Couldn't calculate the effect size, and the, again, the population wasn't small. So, once again, on the website, on our pathway, it was not recommended for treatment of people as a second line agent. You see in the box beneath the red circle the times when we've looked at this. So we looked at it originally back in 2007 in that combination. We looked at it as an update in 2012, and now it's on the static list. So as a general impression of this agent in, in this clinical scenario, we have been around the loops a number of times. We've looked in a lot of detail at various combinations and at various bits of evidence and economics, and we haven't considered it something we could recommend. I've only got a couple more slides, and just, to, just I thought you might be interested in this slide. It's some data that shows who benefited from the Cancer Drugs Fund. Well, actually, it shouldn't be really who benefited. It should be which drugs benefited, I guess. It's... Uh, it's a little pie chart showing the various drugs that were funded over the last five years. And about 80,000 people did benefit, so that's good. That is who benefited. Um, and bevacizumab is the biggest chunk, which is partly why I wanted to show it to you, because it's an interesting bit of data. Bevacizumab, that purpley, no, not purpley, bluey, turquoisey color. But of course, now it is delisted from the old Cancer Drugs Fund. So, very briefly then, in conclusion, we have a robust approach to assessing new drugs through our technology appraisal process. We look at clinical and cost effectiveness data as well as all sorts of other information and increasingly that's more and more explicit and more and more documented because it's really important that we do get as many effective medicines out into the system as possible. There's a cost-sharing mechanism for all drugs, and we are continuing to discuss the cost impact and how we might get drugs into the system at as low a price as possible with NHS England. It's not that value-based pricing that the government was introducing, but it is an absolute desire to get drugs into the system, best value as possible. And the new Cancer Drugs Fund, different from the old, and it's very much about interim, fu interim funding and providing data collection to help us take final decisions on those drugs where there's areas of uncertainty. Thank you. Great to hear the background, and thank you for tuning your way through all the technical data <laughs> as well. That was great. Um, I'd now like to invite Ricard Nagel from Germany to come and talk about the same drug, and we're going to look at what is happening in Germany. <coughs> Yeah, I thought so. Maybe we can avoid the echo now. Is that okay? Is that better? 
Does it sound better? Yeah. yeah? Okay. <clears throat> Would you get me my presentation, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jackie. And let's see, I would like to thank you for inviting us for this whole setting, because I think it was very obvious uh, after the talk we just heard about uh, the NICE and the NHS, how important for the whole area of medical, um, of the medical system and for our societies, this question, who is going to provide what and which society is giving to which patient what, uh, uh, that I think is uh, so crucial that it's not only a question of uh, strategy, it's not only a question of how you manage it, but also it's a normative question of the culture uh, of the society in which you're living on. No, this is Norman Daniels. <laughs> I can't now, no, this is another one. Maybe we don't have it. This one. Ah. This one? Great, there it is. And um, so my, <clears throat> my task uh, in, in this field will be that I'm giving you an uh, insight about the prioritization discussion in Germany. But before I will do that, I will try to, in this question of national comparison, I will try to give you an insight about the whole uh, structure of prioritization uh, strategies, which we at the moment see uh, at least in uh, uh, this area. So um, we, I, would like, I would like to ask for what are the models and what are the strategies or the normative ideas behind these models and then come to Germany and also to our comparison example which we are going to discuss later on uh, with Norman. So if you uh, differentiate in the question of how could you structure your healthcare system in terms of what are you going to provide for each patient, then I think there are certain uh, aspects you first of all have to look at. First of all, you have to look at if in your system it is more important that the severity of the illness, the patient is in the middle of your focus or the maximization of health in total. We had this morning a discussion about the healthcare system in the US and certainly there was a question that the US is spending the most money in healthcare overall in the world, but in the end the outcome for the average of all patients is lower than in other countries. So certainly everyone is trying to search for a model where in the end each patient is uh, treated the best. At the same time, um, the money you spend for it is the lowest. I don't know if you ever will reach that, but maybe that's not the important aspect of it. So if you look at the substance of the discussion, and then we, uh, I try to uh, compare here Sweden, Norway, England, and Oregon models before I come to the German one, uh, then you see that the severity of the illness, for example, is a criterion in Sweden which is in the middle of the focus. And we have heard from Gillian that certainly that is not the middle of the focus of uh, the system in England, but here you have the maximization uh, of uh, health for, over, for the overall community in a differentiated emphasis of cost effectiveness in the middle of the discussion. And the Oregon model, most of you are knowing it, compares uh, then again the severity of the illness, the suffering, the pain of a patient, uh, and then ranks it and gives a concrete uh, uh, proposal if something should be done or not. So the individual or the community, the collective, uh, that I think is an important differentiation in the perspective of the models you are looking at. And then the question is, how are you going to do it? How you execute your system? And we have just heard about the cancer fund, that sometimes you have a good idea or seems to be convinced that your idea is good. And then you feel, or at least you, you get the uh, feedback from your population that this is not going uh, the way people feel that they uh, treat it well, so you have to change or adjust by political reasons. Um, and therefore, I think that certainly is an uh, important aspect. And here again on our um, uh, discussion, we have one point in the middle of the focus which certainly is uh, looked at very uh, late. That is the question of public opinion. 
Julian just has said that now for NICE, it is so important to have a public debate. In, when it was uh, funded NICE, no one even thought about public debate. There was nothing uh, experts would think uh, that they would gain anything from it. And today we certainly know that expert opinion is not enough for making a decision which is important for everyone on the street and in the hospital. And this is not only a question of healthcare, this is a question of all democratic aspects we have today. So I think our debate about deliberation and uh, the question of uh, how we can uh, close the gap between public opinion and expert knowledge is a very important question we have to look at also from science. And in the end, the results, certainly recommendations, guidelines, the question of exclusion of funding, those are the aspects uh, these systems are looking at. So, in the beginning, again, of this whole debate, everyone thought this is just a method. Quality of life, it just, uh, uh, qualities are just a method. And you can use it, and you can make leak tables, and then say, okay, this is cost effective, and you should uh, use it, and you can cut it at some point, and this is only a mathematical method. Certainly that is not true. Certainly you can hear by the last lecture, as well as in all the discussions and uh, uh, papers we hear here, that in most of every scientific approach, you have a normative decision made already. And therefore, this normative decision in question of prioritization is the aspect of who are you looking at in terms of the personal-centered solidarity or of a community-centered solidarity. That is a decision you don't make by your study design, but that is made already in your society or in the aspect you um, organize it. And therefore, I think you compare a country like Sweden or Norway, where the person-centered solidarity uh, is in the focus of the normative decisions, while in other uh, countries like in the English model or in the Oregon model, the community is more in the middle. In Germany, we can say we are not as close uh, to the, or not, not as finished in the debate as some other models because we try to deny that we need to prioritize uh, decisions. Um, we have different approaches. I will uh, come to them, but certainly in the beginning or in the overall uh, uh, looking at it, uh, we at least hear every other time that we have not the need for prioritization of medical uh, aspects so far. And th therefore, we still look at our baseline, which is in the end also for the healthcare area, our constitution, and there we have a very personal-centered approach in terms of rights and uh, aspects for patients. So our solidarity model is a very personal one, uh, and therefore uh, it makes it difficult to make final decisions in terms of saying prioritization means uh, to set someone back if he has a need, uh, and therefore we're trying not to even uh, look at it. So if we, if we now have uh, this measurements in terms of how you organize your prioritization concept, you can see that the whole discussion in Germany was brought up by experts. There was no um, political uh, discussion like in England or in Sweden. There was no aspect of looking at the costs of healthcare system which brought this debate up. But there was Heiner Raspe, who some of you may know from the University Clinic of Lübeck, who started the discussion. And he was a member of the Ethic Commission of the German Medical Association. And therefore, in 2000, this was the first one who gave up um, a statement on setting priorities in healthcare, always pointing out that this would not mean rationing of healthcare that no one would ever lose anything. That was very important, uh, 2000, as, well, as some uh, uh, later on, when uh, the National Ethic Council, um, which I was then a member on, uh, focused on this topic. So you can see there were a few experts who brought it to different steps that this discussion came on, in the parliamentarian uh, aspect, and we uh, then set up a, a research group with 14 different universities 
um, and uh, some of them are presenting at those meetings um, regarding the priority setting in medicine in general uh, to give, as, a, as experts, this whole debate a more uh, funded um, structure. Then, in the beginning of the debate that uh, the physicians got the impression, especially in ambulatory care, that they could not provide all needed medication anymore for their patients because we had uh, uh, funds who would set up a regime and a border for medical spend, uh, for uh, pharmaceutical spending. That was the beginning where the medical association in itself took up this discussion. Uh, and since 2008 uh, and uh, further on, we had this discussion about the rea reality of a hidden prioritization uh, and the question if that could be opened up and if, how, if you do it, how you do it, and if there's a structure or not. This is a difficult discussion in, in the political area and in the public, no one wants to talk about it. And that's the reality we still do have in Germany because uh, I have here three quotations from uh, the um, secretaries of health in uh, different periods of government. And all of them, all three of them, Ola Schmidt from the Social Democratic Party, um, or uh, Philip Wurzler from the Liberal Party, they all mentioned even that they have a very intense insight to the system as well as to medical care, that prioritization in itself is unethical. And therefore, coming back to the normative statements, therefore we don't have a public debate on prioritization in healthcare in Germany. As long as you get the impression that this is an unethical debate, you don't have one. Um, so this is the difficult situation we are in, well knowing that we have the same aspects that Gillian just uh, showed you, that we have a rising aspect, uh, spending on pharmaceuticals, especially uh, in the cancer area, and we certainly need instruments to cut the costs. And I will show you how we do that, and we don't call it prioritization, uh, uh, but uh, we at least do the same as you have uh, just heard in a different way. So in this, uh, and we certainly have one scientific area which denies also the need of prioritization. Those are um, our lawyers, because they say in the general law in Germany, there is no aspect of denying any needed care for a patient. And as long as our law declares that every needed care of a patient is given by the solidarity healthcare funds, there is no chance to discuss about regulation and uh, uh, um, uh, not, not giving a, the systematic um, uh, healthcare. So how we are going to manage that in this situation as we have it now in Germany? We certainly have the same um, problems as all other countries regarding the spending. And yesterday was the World Cancer Day. I don't know who uh, recognized that. And the World Cancer Day in Germany um, was acknowledged not by saying, look at all the positive progress we have had in the last 10 years, but was addressed by the aspect how expensive it is to pay for all the cancer patients we do have. And, and this is the question, will we have a chance in the next decade and even longer to provide all needed positive care developments for everyone? So at least even we deny that we have the discussion in the public and in the media, we do have the discussion and the knowledge that we certainly have to do something about it. So who is responsible? We don't have a NICE, but we have an ICVIC, which is a comparable institution. But over, uh, uh, overall, uh, it is not uh, the government who decides about what is provided uh, for a patient and what not. We have a self-regulating system, and the responsibility for the whole healthcare system is based on um, the, those who provide healthcare, the physicians, the hospitals, and the funds. So these three decide about um, who's 
going to receive what kind of, uh, how much money for each area. And therefore, there needs to be one body who decides what is included in the refunding from insurance and whatnot. And this is a crucial area. It's comparable to what NHS would then in the end pay. And this is the so-called GBA, the Federal Joint Committee. And in this Federal Joint Committee, there is a, a leading person who usually is a person who comes from politics, but now then is neutral. Has nothing to do anymore with the uh, uh, government. And uh, then you have all the stakeholders who are involved. Um, the question of public opinion is still outside because we have a, a patient uh, group within there, but they are not able to vote. And uh, whoever is a patient stakeholder is a difficult question, so therefore we don't have a public opinion so far. This GBA is deciding about every single uh, refunded method and certainly has the same uh, um, expectation or the public has the same expectation to the GBA that new technologies should very fast get into the uh, treatment um, area for a patient who could pro uh, profit from it. Uh, and so the formal process in uh, question of uh, getting um, some knowledge about true new development, true new technologies, um, uh, then can be um, um, sent to the ICWIC, this new established, uh, established uh, institute of quality and efficiency. But this institute just gives advice, collects all the evidence-based data, can make studies for, its, for, for himself, but then just give the, the, his opinion over to the GBA and the GBA then decides. And the GBA decides not always on the basis of the uh, aspect the ICWIC uh, gives to them. So in the process of drug evaluation, we have then a different strategy because it's very obvious that this is not always working, especially in the setting of prices. Um, we have um, made a, um, a situation where the funds themselves can ne negotiate with uh, the different uh, companies. And um, a company, when it comes to price negotiations, has to give a dossier with all the aspects uh, of the positive uh, results they have uh, focused on uh, when they tested this uh, medication. And this dossier should include the evidence, what are the benefits, what are the risks, what are the progress aspects of this new medication strategy. The IGVIC evaluates this dossier and there is only one um, defined uh, situation where this is done by the ICWIC, and that is if the negotiations between the funds and the company fails to find a price, whatever this price would be. Industry and companies are always complaining that this is a system which gives them not an assurance of what comes out in the end. Nevertheless, this is a situation what we have at the moment. It is not known, it is not open, it is not in the public reception what comes out of those negotiations. So no one really has an idea unless those people are talking to each other and you are a member of it, what happens there and why that you can see the costs of medication care in Germany is rising every year about 20%. This is something which we certainly recognize, which is in uh, the public debate. And uh, people ask for well, one aspect which is unusual for Germany. That is the question, is it allowed that pharmaceutical and medical advice companies gain so much money out of the system? I don't know who, who, who uh, received it from the newspapers. We have. Uh, the company Fresenius, which is also active in uh, all European countries, I say, especially in the field of dialysis. And they are going to buy for 5.8 billion um, euros 
a company in um, Spain who is responsible for the dialysis uh, um, in the whole of Spain. They are going to buy it because this company in Spain makes uh, uh, or spends and receives about 2.4 billion euros a year and has a profit of 400 million a year. Who's paying? The taxpayer is paying. Well, the question certainly is, should it, is it all right and is it reasonable <laughs> and responsible that the taxpayer is paying a company 400 billion uh, 400 million, so it's 400 million profit each year. It's okay that you pay what they do. Maybe they have a reasonable profit like others, one or two percent, like the development of uh, uh, the society in general. But is it okay that they have such a large amount of um, money they get uh, for it? So this is the discussion we do have. In this context, uh, what, what is the way we try to uh, adjust the money of uh, the, the price of a medication and there we don't have the quali uh, adjustment. The quali uh, concept is not accepted in Germany but we uh, developed a special new economic evaluation, it's so-called efficiency frontier and uh, what does the efficiency frontier uh, means? You can see here some reasonable medications which are uh, have a relation between the costs and the effectiveness. And you can then imagine that there is some uh, new um, invention or new medication which has a better outcome, a better effect, so the development would be accepted as a new technology if it's higher than which is, which is reached already. So if then you would have a situation where the cost is much higher than uh, yeah, the cost, cost is, would be much higher than the effect you uh, uh, would assume, then the, neg the negotiation should reach an area where you just would say, okay, this is a reasonable uh, increase of uh, costs for a reasonable increase of effect. And this is the goal of the negotiations you will have. You may understand that this is very difficult. Uh, we have uh, Lars Schwedmann with us from uh, our uh, research um, group uh, who may, as an economist in the discussion, can explain better how this is going to function and uh, how, how you would assume that it is functioning. So let me come to the end and to the, our example. We would look at uh, the Avastin. Um, you have heard about uh, the decisions made by NICE and the NHS. This is different uh, in Germany. You still can uh, use Avastin in first, second, and third line um, treatment for colorectal cancer, as well as a couple of other, glioblastoma, uh, um, and uh, um, in uh, mama carcinoma. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, you are open to use it because it's. Uh, allowed to use it in these fields. In 2009, uh, we had the first um, classification. So uh, later than we have it had in uh, uh, the UK. Um, and you could see the difference in the measurement between NICE and ICVIC uh, by a quote, which comes from uh, Professor Zawicki, who was at that time uh, the leading person of the ICWIC by saying that an ethic, a normative approach which leads to a benefit maximization uh, uh, in uh, this field would not be accepted in Germany. And uh, why would it not be accepted? Because people would say it is unfair if there is a chance to have a benefit from a treatment and even, we have heard about it, 1.4 month in average, that you should not deny by economical uh, arguments these 1.4 months for each patient. So that is the situation we do have uh, in Germany. As in this example, if you look at Avastin, there's certainly another uh, 
aspect we have discussed very intensively um, in Germany, and that is a totally different indication because Avastin also works in macular degeneration, which is an eye disease. And then you need a so small dose that the daily dose for a treatment you need it only three or four times. There's not an a day dose for a colorectal cancer patient. The day dose for a colorectal patient, case, a cancer patient lays around 450 euros. Um, if you use it for the macular degeneration, you will get the amount you need for 50 euros. The company never asked for the indication to use it for macular degeneration. So there is no approval that you can use it. You only know it by experience. And they have another medication, Lucentis, which is approved for macular degeneration and which costs about 1,300 euros for each treatment. So now we had this discussion very intensively, also in the public, but especially in the clinics, who wanted to um, uh, not pay all this money for Lucentis, but try to use Avastin. So there we have a high court decision that you have to use Lucentis as long as Avastin is not, uh, has not the indication to be used because it seemed to be not safe. So there's another aspect we certainly have in our question, how we get along with this difficult question, what is a fair price for a fair medication, as well as other technologies, um, which is not answered yet, at least uh, in our country. So far, from my side, thank you very much for your attention. Welcome to Bra, who's going to talk about the Netherlands. Welcome. All right, let me just see whether I can stop this one up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've done it before. Normally, I get an evaluation after, so I've learned to do this quick. Um, all right. Thanks for uh, having me here. Thanks for inviting me. Not many places I get invited to, so I need to be very careful uh, with those places that still want to have me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think the last one of these conferences was the one in Oslo I visited, so I think I need to give a bit more priority to these types of conferences uh, because I really liked what I've seen so far. And a lot of what you can see here is also on Twitter, so I even learned that Rachel Baker got the prize for best shoes during this conference. Uh, everything is on Twitter nowadays. Just as a bit of a background so that you know where I'm coming from, uh, I come from the Netherlands, but that's clear already. Uh, I do some work, I'm an academic, so I do research. Uh, I do research also sometimes paid by other parties, uh, and never product related, but sometimes also the pharmaceutical industry, sometimes the European Union and sometimes the Dutch government or other governments that uh, wish some kind of advice. I'm also a member of the scientific advisory board of the Dutch NICE, or the Dutch ICWIC, uh, which is called the Zorg Instituut Nederland, the Dutch National Healthcare Institute. Um, and what I'm about to say is simply all my own views. Final thing to mention, I'm a health economist, uh, so that to some extent colors the way I look at the world. Uh, I know some of you see economists like uh, the cynic from Oscar Wilde, those people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, I hope to give a bit more of a balanced view uh, in what comes. A bit about the Dutch healthcare system. We are a friendly bunch of people. You don't have to worry about us anymore, not even at European championships because we don't qualify anymore. <laughs> Uh, I could talk about that for 25 minutes as well, but let's not do that. Um, like all systems, we have a unique system. Uh, it's nice to see that we build on the same principles as the UK system, but have a completely different type of system. Solidarity, income solidarity, risk solidarity are at the heart of what we have in the Netherlands, which is the same as uh, in the UK. 
but we have a quite private, privatized uh, type of system or we have private competing health insurers looking for how to uh, uh, insure all people and we have private hospitals mainly who deliver the care. So very privatized, but in the context of social uh, legal structure that will guide them to uh, the route that we would like them to go in. We have a basic benefits package. So every person in the Netherlands who is insured will be insured for one particular basic benefit package. Um, all Dutch citizens need to take out that private health insurance. So they are obliged to do so. So in principle, in the Netherlands, everybody is insured. They can choose which insurer to purchase from every year. And this insurer has no possibility of differentiating price between people. So an old person, uh, pays exactly the same for a similar type of health insurance as a young person would, thus ensuring solidarity. The basic benefits package is not regulated by the companies, it is regulated by the Dutch government. So that decides what everybody is entitled to within this system. I think it's fair to say that what we're looking at here today is only a small part of a total system and only a small part of many rationing mechanisms that we have in those systems, uh, namely HTA. The tricky part of HTA is that it, unlike most of the other things that we have in the Netherlands as well, such as setting budgets or uh, all kinds of other mechanisms, like we have the deductible, this is a form of explicit rationing, which makes the debate on these types of rationing much more fierce, let's say, and much more public and much more lively than many of the other topics that we discuss in the Netherlands in terms of healthcare. Just to show you, it's not just nice making the news. These are some headlines that were directly related to the work of the Dutch National Health Insurance Board. Um, and this makes the newspapers, because every time they say something which is negative, the positive stuff never makes it to the newspaper. But once they say something about something that is negative, it will make it into the newspapers. And there will be quite a bit of outrage. Um, Pompe and Fabri were orphan drugs. I think they set the tone for much of what followed in the Netherlands a number of years ago. Uh, and the one over here is Nivolumab, uh, a cancer drug, uh, especially for lung cancer that was not advised to be reimbursed at the price that was firstly asked, which made the headlines as well. So, uh, you know Dutch to be cheap, you know, we are the ones that you have going Dutch as an expression from. Uh, I think we're up there with the Scottish, if I translate it to uh, the UK context. Uh, but even Dutch people, uh, like perhaps German people, like to think that money does not matter in the healthcare system. And that is being said over and over again, and it's even being said in Parliament in all kinds of political and societal debates. Um, one of my famous quotes uh, from one of the American uh, economists, the first lesson of economics is scarcity, the first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. That's what you see happening also in the Netherlands over and over again. And the other famous quote, Denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Uh, it runs through the Netherlands as well. Unfortunately, you can say that, but it's not true. And it's not true from the same politicians who have said it because they will do stuff that at the end of the day will hurt people. There are real opportunity costs and they are within the healthcare sector and they are outside of the healthcare sector. And nowadays the Dutch government also stimulates a bit the thinking of people in terms of these opportunity costs. And I think that's a very good thing. And I think one of the advantages that the UK has had over, for instance, the Netherlands is that you've pinpointed so strongly towards the opportunity cost of spending within the healthcare se sector, which makes it a health versus health type of debate rather than a health versus money type of debate, which is much more difficult to have. Outside the healthcare sector, less income, less safety, less infrastructure, and so on. In the Netherlands, on average, about 25% of family income is being spent on health nowadays. 25%. That's a lot, right? One year of police costs less than one month of healthcare. Yeah? 
So there are choices to be made in terms of do we want safety or do we want healthcare? Those are not easy choices, but they need to be made and they need to be made somewhere. The cost of primary education for one year is less than two months of healthcare cost in the Netherlands. All kinds of very difficult macro types of comparisons, but they are real in the sense that there are real opportunity costs in these other sectors as well. And within the healthcare sector, we've talked about it already quite a bit also during this conference, displacement. Within a somehow fixed budget, if you get something in, something else will disappear. Normally we don't know what it is, but we know somebody will be hurt at the end of the day. And the magic story that it's all inefficiency that will go away uh, is a very hopeful one, but probably not a very true one. So, what are we looking at? Well, within the Netherlands there is this idea that we need to balance costs and effects. Not blindly, not in terms of very bluntly, but we try to balance the two uh, quantities to get to something you might consider to be maximizing perhaps health or perhaps even welfare. What is the role of this health insurance board? Well, healthcare institute. They give advice. They have more uh, tasks as well, but I'll focus on this one. They give advice to the Dutch Minister of Health. So they advise. They don't make the decision, they advise. If the Dutch minister wishes to take over the advice, which normally is the case, then she will. If not, then she can deviate from the advice. It's also important to know we have two different types of systems, basically. We have an open system and we have a closed system. Most of the system is open. That means doctors start using something new at a certain stage that is considered to be common, and then under Dutch law, given that it's common for the doctors, it will be reimbursed. That's an open system. That means if you want to get into that system, you know who to work with, the doctors. There's also something we call extramural drugs, and for that there is a positive list. Either you are on the list and then you're reimbursed, or you're not on the list and then you're out. So you need an active act to get on the list. If you're not on the list, you're not reimbursed. For extramural drugs, so outpatient drugs mainly, GP prescriptions, we have this positive list. And that was where the focus of much of what we did in terms of HTA first was. So we were into the business of evaluating medicines, which is quite understandable. It's something you see in many countries, but it's also quite wrong because there's no reason why you would look only at medicines and not on other things. By now, the scope fortunately is broadening, not only towards other curative healthcare, but also uh, like medicines, but also diagnostics, uh, sorry, like medical devices and also diagnostics, but also towards more social care type of interventions, opening up a whole spectrum of new types of questions. We have a quite, as, as you probably know, the Netherlands are quite famous for being open. Some people call it blunt. Um, I like to call it open. Um, we talk about a lot of things, including end-of-life decisions, including stuff like euthanasia. But we also had a quite open, unlike the German situation, we had a quite open debate as to rationing. Everybody knew that you had to ration. And by the way, also that debate is not new. Uh, you can go back to medical literature from the 19, just, just after the Second World War, where there was a nice piece in a Dutch journal where they said it's incredible. They had new antibiotics and they cost about one euro per day per patient. And it was clear for everybody that hospitals could not bear those costs. Um, the debate has stayed the same, only the figures have changed in some ways. In the Netherlands, there were three main criteria that always got into these types of decisions. Necessity, how bad is it? How severe is the illness? And does that justify a claim on solidarity on which the system is built? Effectiveness. How well does the thing do that we want it to do? And cost effectiveness. How is the balance between costs and effects? Those three criteria are the main building blocks for the decision-making framework, at least in theory. Get back to that later on. 
There's also an increasing, in the early days, we thought we could look at these things in isolation, in splendid isolation. First see whether or not it's necessary, then see whether or not it's effective, and then see whether or not it's cost effective. By now, there is this realization that you cannot go about looking to these things in isolation, but you need to have some kind of idea as to how they work together. And this is probably why we uh, came up with that particular problem. This is a quality leak table. Um, and in the early days, health economists tended to hope, at least, that if you would have a quality leak table and your aim would be maximization of health, the answer to the, sol the, the solution to the problem at hand would be very simple. Start at the bottom, work your way up until the budget is exhausted. Let's say the black line is where the budget was exhausted. So you would start with uh, a, a great intervention at Sophia's Children's Hospital in Rotterdam, of all places, where children who are born without an anal opening receive an operation immediately after they are born and then live a perfectly healthy life. So otherwise they would have died. Now they live a perfectly uh, uh, life, healthy life. Very expensive, but a great stream of health and therefore a very nice ratio. Then you get Viagra. That's normally where, except for some males in a certain age, uh, there is a bit of unrest in most of the rooms where I show this one. Then we have breast cancer screening, normally fine. Then we have onychomycosis treatment, which sounds quite awful, but it's toenail fungus. So as long as you keep your shoes on, whether or not they won an award or not, uh, there's not so much going on. Then you go to the uh, PTA with stent, high cholesterol, and boom, you're it. It's done. What have you done? You've maximized the health with your budget. There's no way you can spend your budget better than doing this, if you want health maximization. If I ask people in the Netherlands, internationally, wherever, do you like this list? Normally they say no. And if I ask why, I say, well, because there are things above this line. And I say, okay, which ones do you especially like? Well, normally they like the heart transplantation and the lung transplantation. And they especially do not like the fact that I prioritized Viagra and onychomycosis treatment above these two. So that brings two questions and two problems. The first is, if I shift the line so that I do justice to all of you, I open up the floor to almost anything, because the line then is way up there. And the problem is even more fundamental. You do not like the ordering of the list. So whatever I do to shift the line doesn't solve the underlying problem. What is the problem? In the Netherlands, we answered this by saying, in this list, there is no such thing as the first criterion I just discussed, which was necessity. And if I ask people, why do you like heart transplantation? Why do you like lung transplantation? They say, because it's really necessary to have that in. And Viagra and toenail fungus treatment, we could do without. Then the question is, okay, so what is necessity? Because normally, in many of the debates we had in the Netherlands, necessity was in the eye of the beholder. Every patient group would claim their particular problem would entail a necessary treatment. A quality is not a quality is not a quality. But what is necessity? Well, there, we all know that in the literature there are different notions about what is a fair type of distribution. Fair innings is one. So do you have a reasonable health uh, over your whole lifetime? Or is it about how bad is it right now? Something like severity of illness or rule of rescue? In the Netherlands, we chose something that you might call in between, which was proportional shortfall. We calculated the percentage of health lost due to a particular disease. If it's 100%, you're way up there. If it's 10%, 5%, 2% even, like with toenail fungus, it's way down there. Then what? Well, then this. Then you have something that you could call a decision-making framework. A very rough one and a very simplistic one. I immediately agree. 
Here we have cost per quality, like we always have them. The only strange thing is I have QI, namely there could be different qualities because a quality is not a quality. The I stands for the necessity weight that you give to a particular circumstance. It's not an exception anymore. It's not an end of life exception. It's not a cancer exception. Now it's a rule. Cancer can be incredibly high on this list, but so can other diseases. There's no earthly reason why we would favor simply cancer people if there are other diseases that could be just as terrible as cancer, right? So we try to come up with some kind of rule that would capture that. This is the rule. And the upward sloping curve that you see is the threshold. We compare things to this threshold and increasingly higher thresholds are used for increasingly necessary interventions. Where is that line? Well, there have been official documents stating somewhere between 10,000 and 80,000 euros. So the upper point would be 80,000 euros. Is that a hard end point? The answer you can guess, no. Do we believe this captures everything? The answer is no. Gert-Jan van der Wilt is in the room. He was one of the people in the first advice committee for the basic benefits package in the Netherlands. So we feel there cannot be a very simple quantitative framework that would capture everything. We always need something like what you would call here a deliberative process. And people will need to look at the evidence, will need to look at the the first recommendation coming out of this framework to see whether or not it fits, including looking at the underlying assumptions that we made in the calculations, but for, also, for instance also in how we framed necessity, because you can imagine that not everybody favors proportional shortfalls, for instance, over fair innings. So we try to have a transparent and accountable appraisal phase, and you could say we're still learning that like we are in terms of the assessment phase. The fair implementation of results is very important as well. It's not just making a yes or no decision, or not even a yes but decision. It's also about how you implement it. And do you have the policy instruments to do that in a right way? In the Netherlands, for a very long time, we lacked those types of instruments. By now, we have a bit more instruments like price negotiations, and we're thinking about combining this type of evidence with medical guidelines, because that would allow you to much more target what you're doing. But it does need that we need to build a bridge between the medical profession on the one hand and the HTA profession and decision makers on the other hand. Coverage with, ever, ever, with evidence development uh, is also something that we did. Um, it's not an easy one. If you start doing that, you need to think how the back door looks like. When are you going to say, well, we tried this for a while, but now we're going to withdraw it from the doctors and from the patients. In the Netherlands, um, that has proved to be quite difficult. So we're doing quite a few things which I like but there are also quite a few challenges ahead. Improving the equity weighting, for instance. You can have a 100% necessity weight losing one out of one remaining life year. And you can have the same weight losing 80 out of 80 life years. If I ask anybody here, well, most of you here, would you see that as the same thing? Would you give it the same weight? Most of you would say no and they would prioritize the people standing to lose 80. That means that we're not capturing things completely yet. And you can solve it to some extent in the appraisal, but if you know you're doing things wrong, you might as well try and make the assessment better as well. Combining the basic benefits package with those medical guidelines, I think that's a real challenge in the Netherlands. Uh, but also looking beyond what we're doing so far, using simply the quality, it's fine in many curative contexts, but in some of these other contexts, and I know that they've been discussed here as well, you might need other outcome measures, like for instance, the ice cap that was uh, discussed before the uh, lunch. 
before I come to the final conclusions, the Avastin case in the Netherlands. Um, it was a blessing and a curse to get this case. So I tried to look into what we did in the Netherlands for this particular uh, group of patients. It was on the expensive medicine list, which means coverage with evidence development for four years. So there was what we call a T is zero report, an initial appraisal. That wasn't very favorable, but it went on the list anyway. By the way, stuff went on that list where on the back of an envelope you could already calculate that in no circumstance it would ever get to normal cost effectiveness thresholds, never. And they still went on the list. That's a policy mistake, I would say. Because if you don't know what to do after four years, you are setting yourself up for failure, right? So it was on the list. We had the same evidence as NICE had, like everybody had. So let's say not very much going on, not very much to speak for this particular intervention in this particular group of patients. Um, so then I asked for the end report and there was no end report. So on a small scale, to me, this is what the cancer drug fund was on a larger scale. This is escaping the difficult answer, right? This is knowing if we say no, there will be trouble. Um, so can we come up with a list? And that list could be the cancer drug fund. We didn't say no, we just gave him another source. Well, actually we said no within our own system, but now we have a new system with new money. Nobody knows where it comes from. Um, or you just simply do not have a final report, then you don't have a final advice, thus you don't have a no. So it's still covered. Not used that much, but it's still covered. I will cut down on this one, just go to the final one. I think there's one thing that is really crucial because we can spend more and more time on even, you know, on the seventh decimal of the CE ratio, knowing what it does. If we are not prepared to sometimes say no and live with the consequence of having said no, if we cannot get across the reason also to the public of why sometimes we need to say no, I don't see the point in making our calculations even better than they are today. Because we miss the soil where we need to sow these types of uh, figures in. Uh, I think that's still the case in the Netherlands. I think we're progressing. I really think we do. And I think the only way of progressing is to make more tangible the opportunity cost both within the healthcare system and beyond, because if we don't do that, I don't think just with money versus health, we are going anywhere. And with that positive note, <laughs> I will leave you. Uh, so New Zealand has a different model again, uh, similar processes to NICE, uh, using cost effectiveness analysis, um, other criteria that are actually used as well in a positive list, if it's on the list it's funded, if it's not on the list it's not, and an additional point it has a cap budget, only so much money is allocated to pharmaceuticals each year, and that is taken into account where other money might actually be better spent. And in the case of it, ever since, it's been turned down on multiple occasions on the basis that the benefit to survival is very low and uncertain. Also, just note that in the subsequent kind of application that the company has made, the price has been falling. Over to Norman. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah, um, well, let me put this microphone on. Can you all hear me? Okay. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I thank the inviters for inviting me. Um, I had a few slides. Um, they really look at uh, 
this in a rather uh, incomplete way, so I think of this as just beginning a discussion that we might have. Um, let me uh, uh, say a couple words about the practice in the United States, which has been the laughing stock of a lot of <laughs> you. Um, uh, and I can, uh, and then turn to the uh, uh, ap approaches that we had in England and uh, Germany and the Netherlands. Um, so uh, in the US, we also have an ACA, but it's a little different from uh, the one that uh, uh, Werner referred to. Um, so the ACA, which is the Affordable Care Act in the United States, uh, uh, funds uh, comparative effectiveness research for about $3 billion a year, um, but uh, its results can't be used in uh, any form of priority setting. Um, so uh, you wonder a little bit why people would fund something that uh, they can't use. Um, and I do wonder about that. I hope you do too. Um, the, uh, there is a general rejection of rationing health care in the United States, although it happens all the time. It happens by ability to pay and not by uh, other methods, uh, other methods that have been discussed in this conference. So um, uh, I just mentioned that uh, when I was on the Clinton Healthcare Task Force, the one before Obamacare, um, and that uh, Hillary was, uh, Clinton was uh, first noted for, um, there was a prohibition against mentioning the R word, rationing. Uh, so none of us who were on the healthcare task force could ever mention uh, limit setting to healthcare. And I find that the uh, transition from that prohibition to Sarah Palin's re reference to death panels in the last uh, um, uh, election we had uh, of a president. And um, so uh, this is not a big transition. Uh, and on the other hand, um, the reference to death panels did scare a lot of people away from the concerns about priority setting. So I think that the fears that were expressed by Ira Magaziner in, um, and Hillary Clinton in uh, two th uh, 1992, when I was on that task force, have lived on uh, and uh, <coughs> shaped the American uh, approach towards ration, which is non-existent. Um, so uh, I would not expect very many Americans at this conference. Um, uh, I did want to emphasize as a concluding point that uh, in the US, there is a lot of rationing. It goes by ability to pay. Um, so uh, the patient's assistant, patient assistance plans, which we have in the US, I see as an overhead cost of the pharmaceutical companies that are trying to manufacture these drugs is much better from their point of view to pay a few patients uh, a small amount uh, in a patient assistant plan through a foundation and then have a much uh, higher rate of uh, charge that they get reimbursed for from uh, private insurers uh, even with a significant copay. So you cut out with that copay a lot of the poor patients who might, uh, who can't afford that drug, but uh, you as a drug company say, I'm doing very well by my patients. Uh, but I think it's all window dressing on a, a form of uh, cost uh, sharing that uh, is unacceptable from the point of view of 
uh, rationing. So um, uh, I did want to say one more thing, and that was referred to in the third bullet. I'm on the um, Medicare Advisory Commission, or Me Med Medicare and Medicaid Advisory Commission, and I wanted to say something about the um, uh, fact that I've only been invited to one session of the Medicare Advisory Commission, and that was when they were discussing uh, left ventric ventricular assist devices for destination therapy. And I raised the question, couldn't you take all these resources and devote them to, uh, in your population of Medicare patients, couldn't you reduce the frequency of heart failure uh, uh, in various ways? And I was told, you can't raise that question. So uh, that was um, my personal experience with the Medicare Advisory Commission. They didn't want to hear about other ways you might use resources and what the opportunity costs were of approving something. And I find that really baffling. Uh, I have not complained about being excluded from the Medicare Advisory Commission. Even if, um, I, I just am. Um, Okay, uh, so I wanted to introduce to you a couple of questions uh, that I think um, uh, I will come to very shortly as the discussion questions. But I had these questions down as uh, issues that I think were not, uh, we ought to have a, a, cl a clarity about. Uh, so one of the questions is, does the evaluation lead to a decision or a recommendation to others? And I would add as a secondary point, uh, does the decider, in, who is the real decider, it might be the Secretary of Health or the, uh, uh, um, some committee uh, that represents the health system, uh, does that um, uh, decider, have to say why they're turning down the uh, information that they've been given and the recommendations they've been given. Suppose they go in an opposite direction and they cover Avastin when it's been denied um, or ought to have been denied. Um, uh, then uh, should they have to say why they proceed? And uh, the focus that I have on transparency would say, yes, they have to say that. And what you're aiming for is trying to reach a broader audience of people in the democracy that uh, all the countries represent, uh, that presented here. Um, and I think that uh, you would want to have uh, some clarity about why a decision was not lived up to or recommendation was not lived up. Uh, I think a, a second point uh, is, can the evaluations lead to an exclusion from coverage? And we saw a lot of vacillation on that. Uh, um, Werner uh, mentioned that uh, in this in the case of Avastin. Um, I think one of the issues that uh, I'm uh, aware of, but uh, there is very little discussion of, is what the proportion of decisions are that are affected by the kinds of commissions that we're talking about. Are they really the whole of rationing in, and uh, allocation decisions in the health system, or only a, a small piece of it? And my view is that uh, the 20% of the decision making, and that's the only country in which I've seen any figure in the UK, uh, an estimate, uh, and it's just an estimate, of roughly NICE makes a decision that affects 20% of the decision making that's made. And I don't hear any stories from uh, Germany or the Netherlands about the proportion of decision-making 
that goes on. And so I think that's an important issue to clarify in what we do uh, later. Um, and uh, so uh, another question is, how does the agency take costs into account? And we've heard two different stories, a cost effectiveness story and uh, a story about efficiency frontiers from Germany. Um, and uh, I think there are big differences in uh, these approaches to taking costs into account. And we have to think about them. And we have to think about uh, what it means to have a threshold. And is there a justification for the threshold? So the th threshold that we see in, uh, in the UK is uh, under criticism uh, because, uh, well, if, if it's supposed to be the amount of uh, health that you displace with a particular intervention, uh, the argument is, what are the interventions that you're looking at? And you can't be looking at just NICE. You have to be looking at the whole system. And then you get the estimates uh, that came out of York, uh, which say, well, this uh, threshold is much too high. But if it's too high, then so is the 80,000 in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands. And what is the rationale for either one of those thresholds? What justifies them? Uh, the particular approach that uh, I would want an answer to, uh, that is uh, a rationale should be able to answer the question, how important is equity in your population? If you have a lot of differences between the benefits that uh, are shared by the worst off economically parts of the population as compared to the rest, then uh, uh, what justifies um, a particular threshold limit when uh, wouldn't you relax that limit if you thought you could uh, address issues of equity and you thought that was important. So if the uh, efficiency threshold, uh, if the threshold is set by concerns about efficiency and maxim health maximization in the population, then maybe it's leaving out a lot of the concerns of the public. And I would want to see a rationale that reflected those concerns. So, and that brings me to the last point, uh, are a broad group of stakeholders involved? So uh, what I had, and uh, I can see some errors from the presentation uh, presentations people made. Um, my sense is that uh, you do get clear decisions and uh, author authority rests within NICE to make decisions. But uh, in Germany, um, Maybe decision makers uh, can take a recommendation from ICWIG, but they don't have to abide by it, and they don't have to reveal why they're not abiding by it. And uh, I wonder what the story is in the Netherlands. Uh, my sense is that um, this decision maker doesn't have to reveal why they deviated from the recommendations of the authorities that they are, now they may feel political pressure to, to rationalize and explain their behavior, but that's a different story um, from whether they, uh, there is a requirement that they do so. Um, as far as uh, summarizing uh, these questions uh, goes, um, my sense is that uh, you can get exclusions in England. Uh, I'll leave Wales aside, as we didn't talk about Wales. Um, in Germany, we don't get exclusions. We get, uh, but I will come to some remarks about the German approach uh, later uh, when I talk about the method for taking cost into account. Uh, in the Netherlands, we could get exclusions but we could see in the Avassin case, they haven't acted on that. So I wonder what that really means. Uh, if the political pressures are high enough, you don't say no. 
Um, uh, I already mentioned this uh, point about uh, not having data on what proportion of the decisions uh, are the allocation decisions in a particular country. But let me turn to the issue about costs. So I've already made the point about uh, the threshold and the need for a rationale for the threshold. And I can see one mistake in that uh, there's a, a high threshold in the Netherlands, not no threshold. Um, uh, that is, the threshold is 10,000 to 80,000. Is it dollars or? Now we use euros. You, euros. We're within euros. Yes. <laughs> okay. That, that was a remark about Brexit, um, uh, which I didn't make. Um, uh, so um, in Germany, uh, the calculation of efficiency, efficiency frontiers uh, might seem to uh, reduce the emphasis on cost-effectiveness analysis, um, and it does. However, um, uh, there can be different costs for different diseases. So if you calculate the threshold for uh, uh, some classes of diseases, they are much lower than others. Is that a, na a natural uh, phenomenon or is that the uh, result of previous decisions by um, uh, big pharma? And maybe when the class was first introduced into the system. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, uh, what the uh, comparative, uh, what the efficiency frontiers um, would tell us about the cost differences between these different diseases. Um, and if it's nothing, then it, ha it isn't answering a question that uh, decision makers would want to know how much health can they buy per dollar spent um, or per euro spent. Um, uh, in Germany also, I would argue that the um, uh, advisory status that is granted to patient advocates is not adequate to representing all stakeholders in a process. Uh, and I am I have some questions about the citizens councils in the UK because they don't participate at all in specific uh, resource allocation questions, only very generally. And I wonder whether people would say the same things uh, that they do uh, in a general way if they had to make actual decisions. I don't know what the relationship is between them. And so uh, the view I have is that the citizens' councils um, work outside and maybe they influence the um, uh, NICE, but they don't uh, play a role in deciding what to do on particular cases. So, um, the fundamental issues I wanted to come to, and let me stop with that, uh, is whether there's a, a rationing of effective services or not in a system, uh, and uh, what justifies that. And uh, I would add that a second bullet is very important to consider, is there enhanced legitimacy and fairness in the process of prioritization? in the resulting coverage decisions. And I'll leave you with that as questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Norman. That was a great summary and uh, some really excellent questions I think raised there. We're right on three, but I think hopefully it's okay if we take about five minutes or so. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I guess what would be good if we just focus on any burning questions that people have actually got from the four 
uh, presentations today, um, and otherwise maybe hold on to them and see if you can catch up with the speakers at um, afternoon tea. Yes, up here. Everybody's looking at me. Citizens' <laughs> panels. Uh, it's a really interesting question. One of the things I'm responsible for at NICE is our public involvement program, and we've recently been reviewing our approaches to engaging patients and the public in, in the process, and it's not yet reached a conclusion. There will be a consultation on any changes because it is really sensitive. But at, at the moment, we try and manage the difference by having on each committee a... Right, let's talk about appraisals of drugs because it keeps it more simple. But we have we have four members on the committee of patient representatives, and they're generic patient representatives. There's always at least two. They don't have an interest in the topic under consideration. We do have then patients representing advocacy groups who might come to talk to that committee as an expert patient. They might have a vested interest at that point. They come and talk to the committee, they give their perspective, but they're excluded from the final decision making. That bit's quite controversial. The groups don't like being excluded, but if you remember my comment about independence, that's why they, they are. And the patient groups have an opportunity to comment alongside everybody else as part of the consultation that's open and those comments are open and considered alongside everybody else's. But uh, that's how we distinguish at the moment between generic lay input and the particular groups with an interest. Yeah, I think that's a, a point which we have in the same way that the lay uh, um, groups or the public as you call it should be involved. At the same time, a uh, patient representative is not someone who stands outside, who has specific aspects. And if you look, for example, in research funding in the US, you can see that the American Diabetes Association, as a stakeholder, is one of the largest funder of research in that field. Pancreas transplantation would have happened so intensively in the States if the Diabetes Association didn't want it. So, and then you can question this development. Um, and what I've said, is, I think it is more important, we have to close this gap between the impression that some of the decisions which we are making from the political side or from the government side, that this is over the hat of the public because politicians receive the answer, like we have seen in the different newspapers, um, that this now is a scandal if you say no for whatever uh, uh, aspect uh, and I'm not convinced that just by discussing about opportunity cost that will, that will be solved because you always have a person who may be involved and uh, who has a possibility to show his own personal situation to the public today. Could I just say something about the last question? Um, it seems to me that we don't have good um, research on what forms of uh, stakeholder involvement we should have and who should be involved at different uh, levels in the society. Um, and I, I would urge that we need to undertake better research in those areas. I've never seen the Fair Charters Article put into a framework of 
weighted up against other things as well, which is kind of usually used as just you know, oh, I'm a drug dealer. So, but is it really, is it respected in consumption of drugs? So I just want to, has it really known? Is, is, has anyone ever managed to put it to a crime crime? And you know, so then what about the net chance of it ever, if a crime happens, have high quality preschool education, which is good evidence of having a bit of a life And that would be basically choosing the fair chance of that. How, how would you go around it? <laughs> I don't think that there's an answer on your question, but uh, uh, if you look, for example, at our discussion in Germany on uh, organ allocation, where fairness also is an important question, and fairness means uh, very different aspects. Uh, in, from the law side, it means that you have a good expectancy to live with this organ the longest possible time. That is a fairness argument. But if you then have a se severe situation of an acute transplantation, then you certainly know a person with an acute liver failure will live after a transplantation, has a mo mortality after the transplantation of about 40% in the first year. Everyone else who waits for a long period of time has a mortality in the first year of a uh, chance of 10%. So obviously, you should exclude everyone who has acute hepatic failure from transplantation. No one is doing it. So the fairness argument then comes to the point where you try to balance between the severity of the disease, the expectancy of having a chance to, uh, be, um, to, to survive, and then, again, and this question is uh, the long-term living an argument to uh, allocate an organ. So I think that is one of the examples where we try to implement it into a system and then avoid to use it. But just briefly, I, I think fairness is one of the things that we British really value, the old fair play thing. It's perhaps one of the core British characteristics and that's why we don't like postcode lotteries because it's not fair. In terms of applying that to, to NICE, we do, I suppose, have a framework that applies the principles not just to new drugs, to other technologies, but across public health, education interventions, and to social care. So we are applying a framework across a range of different things. And I did just want to point out, because I didn't say it when I was talking about the Cancer Drugs Fund, that perhaps is the exception that proves the rule, because it's providing an additional pot of funding for new drugs for cancer, which really singles out cancer patients. We know it's a priority for people, but there's a whole series of other diseases that are equally nasty that are not having access to that funding pot. Yeah, I think that the difficult thing with fairness is that there are many different types of fairness to look at. Uh, I, I think Daniel just, just also use the, the terms uh, socioeconomic fairness. I think in many of our economic evaluations that is not immediately clear. If it's clear, like in the Netherlands with the societal perspective, you might even think the argument goes in the wrong way because people are more productive um, and could have a better chance of getting particular types of treatment. Um, there is the fairness of um, what I mentioned in terms of fair innings, so looking at lifespan, there's the fair innings looking at how bad is it right now, which is a real medical issue. If people are dropping dead on the street, uh, we will try and do everything to recover those people. Um, so they're conflicting ideas about fairness. I, I have never heard, though, the argument, you are paying a lot for those medicines, why aren't you paying a lot for my medicines without any further referral as to the context of those medicines or what they buy? So in that sense, this was a new argument. It was in the quote, yeah. It, it, I mean, um, I think in that sense, there's also the obligation of, of discussing these different types, sometimes competing types of fairness and coming up with one where we feel, at least as some kind of majority, because well, I think there already has been a session about plurality, people actually feel different about these things. Uh, the average doesn't solve that problem. The problem is simply people hold different views as to what fair is, and that makes it quite difficult. Uh, it also makes the end result quite difficult, because you will never have a story that satisfies all people within a country. That's the difficult thing for NICE, it's the difficult thing for ICWIC, and it's the difficult thing for the Dutch authority as well. 
Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm struck by the fact that a lot of the focus of our discussion is on access to health care, um, that is medicine, rather than uh, the kinds of services that uh, produce health in the population. Um, so I was interested in uh, Jill's um, remark that uh, we might have um, uh, an across the board account. Um, however, that's, uh, in my understanding, not what uh, NICE focuses on. Uh, so um, my view is that uh, people uh, put a lot of weight on the, their status as having an illness and not on why they're healthy. Uh, in a lot of cases, we don't know why we're healthy. We're just healthy uh, out of luck or good luck um, uh, or because some society did something to reduce the risks that we face. But we don't know what the difference is. I might have been a healthy person in a much riskier environment than the one I live in. Uh, on the other hand, when I get sick, I know I need assistance. And uh, that it may explain, uh, though it doesn't necessarily justify, the focus on medicine uh, that we're all concerned with. And if you think about patient advocates, again, they're going to be focused on, oh, well, I have a loved one who is uh, uh, struggling with this illness, and they need assistance. And I'm going to do everything I can to get them assistance. And um, that may be a distorting picture, because lots of people have illnesses. Okay. Just take one last No, I think you're absolutely right. So um, the quality leak table I showed was the starting point for the discussions in the Netherlands. We always had this criterion of necessity, but we never actually knew what to do with it. Uh, we tried to get to terms with it. We weighted different types of operationalizations of the concept of severity, and we could have picked many, uh, like the ones you described. Um, and the starting point was proportional shortfall. Why? I think to some extent it was simply the thing that at, the, at that moment in time had the most support. It also had political support, so it was a, a major step forward. By now, I think we see these types of limitations of the calculation of proportional shortfall. Um, is that a bad thing? I don't think it's a bad thing because what I think we have gained is the systematic way of also looking at severity of illness um, now operationalized as, as proportional shortfall, but in our thinking about what to prioritize and what not to prioritize. Now comes the next level, and that is we know the shortcomings of proportional shortfall. Can we improve it in terms of quantifications? Or do we need to rely on the appraisal phase to correct some of those things when it comes to particular diseases where we feel that the calculations we have made do not do justice as what we feel would be fair, to use that term again. Um, but that's a difficult one. I mean, my personal feeling would be that it would be very nice if we could make the calculations better, more in line with what we feel would be just but I don't think we will ever find a rule that would preclude a subsequent appraisal in particular circumstances. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stop there.
we've, we've now eaten into our afternoon tea time. Apologies for that, But um, please all join me in thanking the presenters for the <laughs>